Our next speaker is um, Adrian Kennard from Andros and Arnold. Um, Adrian's been doing quite a lot of work um, on getting DSL services to work with BT's 21 Century Network. So he's going to give us his perspective on that from um, the experience, operational experiences that he's had. Morning. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm beginning to wonder whether I've made my slides not technically enough now. I've not been to this forum before, but uh, feel free to ask questions. Just to say who we are, Andrews and Arnold Limited or AISP are a bit of a, a niche technical ISP. We've got quite a few of our customers here in the room today, I think. We've been in doing communications for about 12 years, starting with mobile phones, but uh, very technical customer base. And I personally have a background in software. I've done R&D for people like SDC and Nokia and I run the company. I'm also involved with Firebrick, who make routers and firewalls, so I get involved in writing IP stacks from the Ethernet drivers up, so hopefully this will make sense to you. I thought I'd start with what we expected from 21CN. I don't know who here has been sort of speaking to BT from the beginning about this, but uh, there were lots of high hopes when 21CN started. The whole idea that BT are going to change their core network to one IP-based infrastructure with voice and broadband and Ethernet and everything all together. Single interconnects into us. No messing about with ATM anymore, thankfully. Single voice and broadband cards at the exchange, so there's no messing about with splitters and uh, patch, uh, patching and jumping in the exchange. And it should obviously be just as reliable as the existing networks, because it's meant to replace it. That's, that's the dream. We were also hoping that uh, there would be quicker development of new services, better broadband services like ADSL 2 Plus and Annex M, higher upload, a better core network, being able to put things like priority tagging on traffic, prioritizing VoIP over the network, for example. And of course, the big driver for all of this is saving costs. BT want to save massive operational costs with 21CN, and obviously we're hoping they're going to pass on some of those savings to us. To explain a bit about the te technical aspects, there's two ends. There's our end. We have one big pipe to BT. So part of the idea is, is already solved. It's, it's IP. And it's very scalable. Instead of having to buy 155 meg BT Central ATM links, we actually have gigabit links. We have two gigabit WES links into Telehouse. They were installed very quickly. BT expedited the order. They were in in a few days. It was quite scary. We were on a trial with BT, and um, they spent weeks plugging the other end in. So we had this, this fibre sat there. Thankfully, because it was a trial, we weren't having to pay for it either, which is good. The way they've done it is they put a simple IP4 slash 30 on each of the WES links and run BGP over it. Much simpler than the arrangements we've dealt with for 20CN. They do have some slightly odd arrangements for radius, which I'll go into in, in a little bit more detail. They don't actually use IP as you should. They start messing about with NAT, and I think anyone who knows me knows my opinions on NAT. The, the setup with Radius really didn't handle failure well. The whole idea of these two links is that they work as a fallback arrangement. If one of the links breaks, then it can use the other. They'd cun cunningly engineered the Radius so that it had two destination addresses and two links, and instead of trying all four combinations, it tried exactly the wrong two. Um, if we had a link break, and it would try the IP address of the other link down the working link and got nowhere, and then try the IP address of the, the radius server that was working down the link that wasn't, and alternate nicely between them. So a nice 100% failure. I'm pleased to say that um, BT were actually quite happy to work with us. They took the idea of being a on a trial seriously and took our feedback, and um, after several weeks, they came up with some cunning hack in their network to, to allow us to announce um, some of their IPs via BGP to them that would mean it would work when, the link, when one link was down. But um, the end result is it does actually work, and we do get radius through even if one link is off. Using BGP on this, uh, as I said, it's a great improvement over 20CN with the, the ATM links. Uh, the ATM links have complicated arrangements with lots of IP addresses that are all natted for different things and static routes all over the place, and it's a nightmare to get right if you have to set it up from scratch, as we had to recently. And... BGP is a lot easier. Every IP address that BT need us to talk to, they announce to us. They only announce about three blocks to us. It's nice and simple. And every, every IP address we need to talk to them from, we announce to them. So very easy. 
In theory, it should allow BT to make more of their network visible to us. They could choose what they're announcing to us and we could see it. They're not doing that. This is purely for the broadband service at the moment. The link itself, the web circuits, use VLANs for no apparent reason. They seem to be just the way they've set up the WBMC link to us. And even though, because it's all VLAN, they could put other services on these WES links on other VLANs to connect to other bits of BT's 21 services, they don't. The radius side, um, I've sort of explained this already. They, they, they have two pre-configured pre endpoints. Um, it uses a platform radius. Every connection from our customers comes into us as a platform radius. We then say where to connect it to. So we give it an IP4 tunnel endpoint, and they then connect to that. Obviously, that has to be on a block that we're announcing through BGP, otherwise they can't talk to us. It is very flexible. It allows us to control exactly where each session goes. So if we have multiple LNSs, we can control all the traffic. We can move traffic from one to another overnight quite easily. It also means we can work with resellers. We've got people who take L2TP from us and people who are planning to, and it means we could actually direct the traffic straight to them as long as they're peering directly with us and we're telling BT about their IPs. So they bypass some of our equipment completely and go straight to the customer, which is quite nice. I've put at the bottom there circuit ID and line speed on the radius and L2TP connections. It's fairly obvious, if any of you know L2TP, that when you get a connection, you know what actual line it's coming from. Calling line identity on dial-up, it would be. And uh, you know what speed it is. This is new for BT. They don't do it right on 20CN. You don't get the information on the L2TP. Uh, but they are getting it right on 21CN, mainly because we shouted at them a lot. I couldn't really get away without a small plug for what we're doing. We've chosen to put our own Firebrick FP6000 L2TP router on the end of these links, something we're making and hope to, hope to be selling to ISP soon. It'll handle a gigabit traffic, very low power, one U box. We do some clever things with it because we do multiple line bonding downlinks, so we'll send traffic balanced based on the line speeds down multiple lines with very fast fallback. We actually do an LCP echo on every line every second, do constant quality monitoring. We, we track all the latency and loss on every line. Very useful for uh, fault reporting and tracking stuff. We also do native and tunneled IP6. So that's a bit of a plug for our box, but gives you an idea of what we're doing. If we move on to the other end, the other end where the end users are, where really the end users shouldn't see a big difference changing over to 21CN. Well, the first surprise we got was that BT aren't using the combined PSTN and broadband cards, even though one of the whole ideas of 21CN is you have a single, up-to-date, modern line card at the exchange connected to the customer that does everything. They're not doing it. And it's all political. It's all down to Ofcom and would this BT give uh, them a, a monopoly type advantage over other ISPs. I'm not entirely sure why they don't just interconnect with other ISPs the other side of the modem, but... No, so what's happening is we have exactly the same silly arrangement with a, a jumpering from the phone line to a separate piece of equipment, this time called an MSAN instead of a DSLAM. It's a shame, but it does mean we have the same issues with jumpering being wrong, faulty wiring, faulty BT engineers. Um, but it does provide ADSL 2 Plus services, and we have quite a bit of control over that. We can control if it's allowed to do ADSL 2 Plus or stay on ADSL 1, which is relevant for some particularly dumb routers. We can control some of the stability options on the dyna dynamic line management, so we can make a line prefer stability over speed. And we can even cap the line at 448k uplink, but we're not entirely sure why anyone would want to do that. We do have extra features that are coming along. Um, Annex M isn't there yet. That will give customers a lot more upload, and we have lots of people asking for this, and BT tell us that lots of their customers are asking for it. Uh, but they haven't actually given us a timescale yet. They're sort of saying it's on the list. So we're hopeful that will come along soon. What we don't have, and we've asked for, is control over the actual line settings. We can't set the SNR margin on the line. And we keep asking, and BT seem to think that it would be a bad thing to give an ISP this low level of control. They think they're going to have more faults and more problems. They do have trouble coping with an ISP that's got some clue about how these things work, sadly. That didn't go on to the next slide. Ah, better. Okay. Um, when we did a trial with BT, 
They thought they would trial just new installs on new phone lines. They thought they won't bother trying migrating from existing circuits. So we did lots of tests on new installs, and they seem to work. We have an online checker that means that when someone orders service from us, we can check if they're available on 21CN or not, and that mostly works. And some exchanges are well ahead of schedule, which causes a lot of confusion with customers who think they won't get service till sort of next April and had service in January. BT's targets for the coverage for this are 40% of the country, or of lines, by the end of March. And we think they're on target for that. We have a massive list of upgrades to go through for April. They're then talking about 60% for end of March 2010 and 66 for end of March 2011. Unfortunately, BT are being very non-committal with any 21CN stuff. They won't guarantee anything. Every sh I don't know if you've been to BT presentations, but everyone you go to has a slide they gloss over at the beginning from their legal department, basically saying, don't believe a word we're saying. Certainly don't trust it. So when in theory we'd got through the trial, which BT then extended until the end of the year because of all the problems, we discovered regrading lines from 20CN to 21CN had, um, to put it politely, teething problems. In, in essence, BT had to allocate a new port on the MSAN, change the jumpering, and it would just work. But just to give you a few of the examples, there were lines just not regraded, which wasn't too bad because the customer was still working. There were delays. There were engineers messing up jumpering and getting it wrong, which fairly unavoidable, but they did it a lot. They jumped equipment, jumped to equipment that was not in service. That was fun. They jumped to equipment that was in service, got sync, even got through to our platform radius, but there was no backhaul between that bit of BT's network and us, or rather, our end. And one of the worst cases was Stepney Green in Docklands, is one of the, the 20 metro nodes. And uh, we had customers in Docklands that could connect to that, and there was no backhaul from there to our WBMC, which was connected to Stepney Green in Docklands. So the, the missing backhaul was probably a few meters of fiber in the building. And of course, these customers had no service for many days while it was being sorted. We also had fun with availability checker, where BT would, would mark an exchange as available, and uh, we'd put orders in, and actually it wasn't available. They have a process for migrating uh, customers on bulk, 10 lines minimum per exchange, which we're a small ISP. There's quite a lot of exchanges we don't actually have 10 customers on, so that's caused them problems, because they want us to do the migration, because we're one of the few people actually testing this. So they've, they've made a bit of an exception for the moment with that, which is good. But they still have problems. Now, I've put at the bottom here that it's a lot better. When I wrote these slides a week ago, I would have said, migrations are just working. Very rarely do we have a problem. It's usually an engineer can't make a wire go in a slot properly. This week, however, BT have messed up again. Yet another way they've gone wrong. And this time it's uh, some problems with a particular make of MSAN that decides to shut down the card completely whenever they adjust the settings. So we've had a couple of dozen customers this week without service for over a day. So a bit disappointing. But they're still working on it. It is getting better. Reliability. Um, it's not just the, the end user connections and engineers actually moving bits of wire that can be unreliable. They've had some interesting core network issues. Now again, I'd say this is a lot better now. And I'd say it's as good as 20CN now. But they've had some strange things where timeouts in their network would lose Birmingham completely. Uh, I'm sure there's some that would say that's not a bad thing, but we, we like our customers, in, even those in Birmingham. I did live there for a while, so I can say things like that. Lots of planned outages now as well. We're a bit surprised, but at the moment they're doing quite a few take a line out for two hours in the middle of the night type thing, or take out a whole exchange. We're hoping this is something that they're going to get over and there'll be less planned outages. They've also had some really weird routing issues where they could talk to one of our IP addresses from one RAS but not another. And they've got some strange broken routing caches in a router somewhere. Fortunately, we have the phone numbers of, um, of um, Dick and Ken in BT who are reputed to be a bit like Batman and Robin and not allowed to fly on the same plane and things. So, But uh, we can get hold of them and tell them when there's serious core problems in their network that no one else has noticed. One of the things I thought I'd mention is native IP6. I think we've got a bit on IP6 later today. 
we're one of the few ISPs supporting native IP6, and we got a bit of a surprise with the 20CN network that is broken, a known Cisco bug that was fixed three years ago, and it turns out BT aren't updating iOS and are running three-year-old iOS, means that L um, native IP6 doesn't work on half of BT's BVASs, and BT aren't going to fix it. BT have referred to a particular line in the contract that says they only support IP4 and made a nice public statement that they don't support IP6 on any of their broadband platforms. That was us that got that. We put a workaround in place. It's actually a very obscure bug, and we, I did a lot of packet dumping and handcrafted packets to find out what, and we've worked out that we can pad the IP6 packets slightly and the bug goes away. But this kind of rattled BT's cage, rather. I believe it got on Slashdot, um, and senior people in BT got very upset. So BT have actually come back and been positive about this. We've managed to persuade this dinosaur to move in the right direction. And they are saying that um, 21CN will properly support IP6. Now, we're saying it works. They deliver us a PPP service, and, and the contract doesn't have this little clause about IP4 in it, which is nice, so it should work. But they're saying that they agree it should work, which is nice. So if it actually breaks, they might fix it. And they've also said to us that they are committed to properly supporting IP6, not only as a, a PPP function on the L2TP, but also supporting it properly with PPP termination and aggregation, routed services within BT. They haven't given us timescales, it's a long-term project, but they've turned around completely and said they're embracing IP6 now. So we're quite proud of that. To give you a little bit of an idea on some of the other operational things, not to do with IP packets this time, but how we deal with BT, we're using uh, XML and SOAP interfaces. I don't know how many people here have played with that, but it's a bit of a nightmare. And to our surprise, we think we know more about XML than BT now. We're a tiny ISP. We knew nothing about XML at all, other than it's a bit like HTML. Um, having played with it a bit, written our own libraries, written our own stuff, uh, we're finding that we're telling BT where they're making mistakes now. And with the new ordering stuff, there were some lovely novice mistakes it took them a month to get things working because we have an ampersand in our company name. And someone thought it's a good idea to inject our company name into XML internally in BT without escaping it. And then the next bit of BT said no. It took them ages to solve that. And then lots of really novice mistakes, 12-hour clocks in XML timestamps and mixing up UTC and local time. In incredible stupidities that we now know anybody who knows anything about XML wouldn't make these mistakes. So. That's quite funny for a tiny company like us and a big company like BT. They had some glaring design emissions. They thought nobody using WBMC would want a migration code, so they hadn't designed that in at all, which is why it didn't work when we tried it. That works now. We had some very clever people come in, spend ages on conference calls to bits of BT, asking where the next message had gone and following it through the system, and a lot of it's working now. Looking at the way forward, IPStream Connect will let us put all our 20CN customers onto our new 21CN pipe. We're really looking forward to that. It will save us, um, I don't know, 10 grand a month or something. So we're, we're, we're only a small ISP. That's going to be quite nice. It will also let us expand as we need. With a few days' notice, we can up the bandwidth on our gig pipe as we need. And with 30 days' notice, we can put another gig in. So that's what we want. We thought we were going to have it early 2008. They launched it end of July 2008, and then we discovered, actually, that's on three-month lead time. Then, they, then we discovered, actually, we'd have to put backhaul into everywhere to use that, like Entovar, and that WBMC won't be doing it until late last year, and then early this year. Now they've said August 2009, and since making these slides, I've heard them talk about September 2009. So fingers crossed it will happen soon. They are muttering about a trial, which hopefully will be sooner. I've mentioned a lot about 21CN broadband, but there are other aspects of 21CN. Some of the things that are now coming out are BT's Ethernet services, and um, I'm probably placing an order for this next week. This will allow us to provide something like 90% of business addresses by April with Ethernet fiber connections. And we can then give people 10 meg, 100 meg, gigabit even if they want, with backhaul across to us. Needless to say, it's extortionately expensive, but it's a start. It's proper Ethernet layer 2 traffic between customers and us. And it's all done with VLANs, straight into BT's MPLS core. And it includes site-to-site -site traffic. 
and a wide variety of access means, including EFM I put on here is Ethernet first mile, which is Ethernet over multiple copper pairs. So we'll have people a long way from the exchange able to have 10 meg symmetric on sort of up to eight pairs of copper to get it there. So a bit of a difference to uh, ADSL. 10 meg symmetric, if you know, is very good at home, if you've got it. Unfortunately, our end of this is another separate gig link. And the idea of putting it all down the same link has sort of occurred to people. I, I, I waited until I'd had the whole speech about convergence and 21CN before I asked the question, and the guy was very embarrassed. Ethernet services need a separate gig link. And this is because different parts of BT have different product lines that say, oh, we'll put a WES in here and a WES in here. And if they use the same link for broadband and Ethernet, they won't know who's going to fix it when it breaks for a start. Um, they'll get very confused. Hopefully, they will eventually be able to do this, but at the moment, we're, we're using it as an opportunity. We're going to put it on separate routers and separate transit because our customers like the idea of a, an ADSL backup that's actually independent. But it's an exciting new service. Be interesting to see how well it goes. We have lots of technical questions for them, which they haven't been able to answer yet. So, to conclude, 21CN offers a lot of hope for the future. It, it's a massive project, and a lot of that is still hope, not reality. At the moment, we're catching up with trying to provide the same as 20CN using 21CN technology. I suppose they've got another 91 years to get it right. There are new services like Ethernet emerging, and uh, broadband on 21CN is, is pretty much ready now. I mean, this week's problems with migrations are the latest hiccup. They'll go away. We've got some huge number of migrations in April. I'll probably be pulling my hair out in April. But um, it's taken a lot longer than we expected or BT expected, but I think we're getting there now. So I think the future's bright for an ISP that is prepared to, to take this on and prepared to, to work through the issues as we have. And I think that is the end of my presentation. It must be, it's not going any further. <laughs> any questions? Oh dear, <laughs> that's, that's either a good sign or a bad sign, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, a question from uh, Ben eight six zero seven on IRC, <laughs> and he's saying on WBMC the committed bandwidth is per host link. Have you got any way with BT towards using multiple host links for resilience without having to pay for double the bandwidth you actually need, so you can deal with a host link failure? Ah, right. Um, there's actually a lot of working group discussion in 21CN with this. At the moment, we have two separate gig links that are designed as a resilient connection to BT. And this is where the BGP comes in. So if one fails, the routing will go via the other. We suspect the BGP timeouts are way longer than our LCP timeouts, so everyone will fall offline and then come back online. But at least they'll be connected and they'll be back online automatically. Um, the problem is at the other end it's one bit of BT kit and one exchange and as we discovered it's quite easy for someone to break into Stepney Green and nick everything. Um, that was a fun day. What we're hoping to have and we haven't really got proper progress on is having a separate host link in a separate physical location onto BT's network with, uh, with paying for the bandwidth only once. BT are talking about doing something where because they, they don't think they can meter it or limit it properly because they actually traffic shape our bandwidth and they, they can't cope with traffic shaping across two different sites. And what they're talking about is setting it up in a sort of DRM type, uh, di well, disaster recovery type sis, um, situation where they won't properly meter it but they'll expect us to only use one site at a time and um, that's, that's the sort of discussion they're making at the moment. But nothing's firm yet. Anything else? No. Okay, thank okay. you very much, Adrian. Thank you.